Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, nice to uh, share with you folks in Eastern Washington and Idaho Panhill and Northwest. Uh, so I thought I'd share with you uh, a photographic presentation I put together uh, of uh, the trains on the route between Malden and Avery in the 1970s. Um, I'm not the person to consult for history uh, back in the early days like uh, like Mark Barleski shared for you, but uh, I think I can tell you a good story about uh, the 1970s. And so if you're out on the trail and join it, you can have a sense of what it was like uh, when the trains were running. Okay, so here we go. A little, uh, I probably don't know most of you, so let me give you a brief introduction. Uh, I'm a professor in industrial engineering and operations research at Berkeley. I've been on the Berkeley faculty since 1979. Uh, but before that, I worked in the operating and marketing departments of Union Pacific Railroad, uh, 1970 to 75, and some of my assignments were up in that territory. Uh, I worked as the agent at Tico and the agent at Dishman. I was an operator at Walla Walla and at Sandpoint. Uh, and then uh, later I was the, uh, uh, the division car distributor at Hinkle, distributing empty freight cars to customers all across Oregon, Washington, Idaho. And then I was uh, uh, the service planning analyst uh, interfacing between marketing and transportation in the Omaha headquarters for a couple of years. Uh, so the photographs that I'm gonna show you, um, we're gonna go from Malden to Avery, proceeding west to east, all photos from the 1970s, the last decade of the Milwaukee Road out west. Uh, and these are a mix of my own photos and photos in the collection of the Cascade Rail Foundation. Uh, and the foundation photos are primarily the work of uh, David Clowender and a couple of photos from Daniel Perkins. And uh, so I'd like to express my thanks to Paul Kruger and Mark Borleski for making these photos available for inclusion in this presentation since uh, my coverage was far from complete in this section of the railroad. Okay, so um, you heard about the Columbia Division and the Coast Division is that uh, by the 1970s, uh, all of the railroad in Washington State and the Idaho Panhandle was part of Milwaukee Road's Coast Division. Uh, and you see the map of the whole division here. And then of course, we're concerned tonight about way over on the right-hand edge of between Malden and Avery. And we're gonna take a little tour proceeding uh, from Malden over to Avery. Uh, and uh, you see the dotted line from Marengo up to Spokane after 1914. That was the route of the passenger trains in order to serve the Spokane market. And unfortunately, uh, Malden and Rosalia and communities like that lost out. And then they returned to the main line uh, at Plummer. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, so I'll also include a few photos from that segment between Spokane and Plummer since that portion of that also was Milwaukee Road track. Okay, so someone asked a question about the gap. Uh, and uh, as Paul mentioned, uh, the Milwaukee Road main line was electrified from Tacoma to Othello, a couple of subdivisions, 208 miles. And then from Avery, Idaho, across to Eastern Montana, four subdivisions uh, to Harleton, Montana. And electrification was proposed for the segment in between uh, Othello through Malden to Avery, but uh, that never happened uh, as the company ran into financial trouble. Uh, and so that 212 mile segment from Othello to Avery became known as the Gap. So tonight's presentation includes one of the subdivisions in the Gap from Malden to Avery. Uh, and that subdivision was very well engineered. Is uh, You notice the track wanders around on the map as you go east from Malden. Uh, and that was engineered so that the line uh, very steadily ascended on very moderate grades. So for 42 miles, uh, it's uphill on very slight grades of 0.4% or less, uh, uh, and all the way to the east portal of Tunnel 41, which was known as the Sorrento Tunnel, about two miles west of Plummer. Uh, and then after the tunnel, uh, the line starts descending on a 1% grade, uh, through Plummer, down Plummer Canyon, 
uh, 15 miles uh, to Benoit Lake, which is an arm of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Uh, and then at the lake, it picks up the St. Joe River, uh, which it continues to follow east through St. Mary's over the remaining 51 miles to Avery on grades of 0.4% or less. Uh, so you saw like in the photos, the, uh, the moderate sized steam engines, which could uh, handle a train over this well-engineered line, no problem. Uh, and as was mentioned, most of the traffic on the line was bridge traffic that originated or terminated west of the Cascades. You saw the big network Milwaukee had in my previous map uh, slide. Uh, but there was some traffic that originated in our territory. Uh, uh, seasonally, there was very strong long haul potato traffic that originated in the Columbia Basin at places like Moses Lake and Warden and Othello. Uh, and then in addition, some of the stations in the Idaho panel, Panhandle uh, generated long haul lumber and plywood traffic, uh, such as St. Mary's and Coeur d'Alene. Uh, this is a little uh, excerpt from uh, the 1973 employees timetable for the Coast and Rocky Mountain divisions that covers the segment from Avery to Malden. Uh, and uh, we, we should read up, since we're going to go eastward, we're going to start at Malden and work our way up uh, through these station names. And let me, let me say something about station names. Uh, anywhere there was side tracks on a railroad, that place was given a station name to designate it. Uh, and uh, so uh, if you look in, uh, you have the distance to the right of the station names, you have distance from Avery and then the next column where it says C rule 6A, uh, where there's a big stretch of symbols, that's where there actually was a station and staff. So Malden, Plummer, St. Mary's and Avery were the only places with stations and staff in the 1970s. And all the other names are just simply where there were sidetracks, where perhaps there was a grain elevator or a lumber mill uh, or a log loading station or the like. And then that first column, sidings, uh, where you have the capacity in cars, where it's like 90 or 100 cars, that's a useful passing track for where trains opposing trains can pass. One train can turn off on the siding track and let the other train by and then come back out on the main line. And then the other tracks are industry tracks where cars could be spotted to be loaded at grain elevators and the like. Okay, so here we go. Uh, a little more information is that as was mentioned uh, in uh, Mark said November, I had December, but anyway, late in 1974, uh, until then, the train and engine crews were exchanged at both Avery and Malden. Uh, a crew would get off and a new crew would get on. Uh, but uh, in late 74, the crew terminal at Avery was shifted to St. Mary's, Idaho, and the crew terminal at Malden was abolished. Uh, and so then the crews were working between St. Mary's and Othello, uh, and the crews based in Malden had to move. Um, there were crews based in East Spokane to bring the freight traffic uh, to and from the mainline connection at Plummer. And there were other crews based at St. Mary's that worked the branch line south to Beauville and Elk River. Um, I'm gonna have little uh, side captions on these photos that uh, mention what the Milwaukee Road train it is, what freight train it is. Uh, and the nomenclature for Milwaukee Road freight trains in the 1970s were, were alphanumeric symbols. Uh, and here's some examples. So 261C, it refers to, uh, the freight trains had numbers. Uh, 261 was the priority freight train. Uh, and the C meant it originated in Chicago. Uh, and this was uh, the most important westbound train in the early 1970s and uh, through the 1960s. It was called the XL Special by the marketing department, re referring to that it could accommodate extra large equipment like uh, automobile carriers you saw in the picture of the wreck at Pine City. 262S was a priority freight train originating in Seattle, Tacoma. Uh, that had the marketing name of the Thunderhawk. Uh, again, these were the, their fastest uh, service and the highest priority freight would be handled on these trains. Uh, at the other end is that uh, very low priority traffic 
uh, which wasn't in a hurry to get anywhere, uh, would sometimes be handled in separate trains if it didn't fit on the priority trains. And in Mo Milwaukee Road nomenclature, these low priority trains referred to as dead freights. And I think that's a reference back to the days when a lot of priority freight was things like perishables and livestock. They were things that were alive uh, and things like lumber and scrap metal and so forth was not alive. So that was dead freight. Um, the 1970s was a, a dramatic period of change for the Milwaukee. The Burlington Northern merger had been approved uh, and took effect in March 1970. And to get that merger approved, uh, there were a lot of conditions granted, uh, which uh, brought more traffic to the Milwaukee. Just before the BN merger, there were essentially two trains each way at, per day through uh, Malden and Rosalia and Tico and Dishman, uh, and an extra train at dead freight occasionally. Uh, a year later, this had expanded to three trains each way per day, so uh, more crews were needed and the Milwaukee hired more employees and traffic uh, was growing as a result of the merger conditions. Uh, the most important merger condition was the Milwaukee got rights into Portland, Oregon, uh, and that brought a lot of traffic to the main line. Uh, and by 1973-74, uh, uh, well, there were not only three trains each way, but on some days there were even four trains. And this was uh, the modern era peak of traffic on the Milwaukee Road lines west. Uh, and again, more crews were hired. Uh, crews were transferred out from Iowa and other places with declining traffic, and they found work uh, out in the Northwest. And uh, I think many of them were very happy to be out in the beautiful Northwest rather than back in the cornfields. Uh, but then things started to change. Uh, uh, 1975, we're back to uh, two trains every day and sometimes a third train on many days. Uh, and by 1978, we're down to only two trains each way. And by 1979, on most days, there's only one train each way. And occasionally there's, on some days, there's a second train. Okay, so here we go. We'll start at Malden. Um, you saw the uh, historical photos of the Malden Depot. It still existed uh, into the 1970s. Uh, this is a photograph uh, David Clowender took in November 1974. Uh, and that uh, green signal uh, next to the depot is not indicating the occupancy of the track, uh, but this is in indicating whether the operator in the depot has messages for the trains or not. Uh, and so a clear signal means there's no messages for westbound trains as we're looking westbound in this photograph. Uh, and then the opposite view of the depot from the other side uh, it, it we have here. Uh, this is a photograph of mine uh, near the end, August 1979. Um, and we have uh, an eastbound dead freight on the left in the past uh, coming up and the westbound uh, 201C uh, uh, freight, uh, transcontinental freight from Chicago uh, on coming from the right. Uh, at the other end of Malden, uh, going eastbound, we have uh, uh, an August 1971 photograph of train 264. Uh, this train handled uh, the ice refrigerator cars of the Columbia Basin potatoes. So here we are in August uh, and there's a heavy shipment of uh, potatoes uh, and you see all the ice bunker cars uh, some of them have the hatches open uh, and uh, where ventilation was, uh, the shipper decided was sufficient. Others have the hatches closed where they're filled with ice. Uh, the cars were topped off with ice at the Othello ice dock and then the train had 18 hours to make it to Deer Lodge, Montana uh, before re-icing was required. So they had to hustle uh, with the potatoes. You can see the uh, uh, on the right, the concrete uh, base for the oil tank to refuel steam locomotives and the track curving off of the Y to turn locomotives around. Uh, about uh, four miles east uh, of Malden uh, on the railroad, we come to Squaw Canyon and a grain elevator. So even though there's no station here, it's just 
a side track where grain can be loaded. You see the station sign there uh, designating this location. And then continuing east another five and a half miles, we come to Rosalia. Uh, and here we have an uh, eastbound train. Uh, the autos are on their way to Spokane. They'll be set out at Plummer and uh, hauled up to Spokane. These autos came up from assembly plants in California. Uh, uh, by the way, I, I'm going to go through this uh, slides uh, promptly. Uh, and if you have questions, uh, put those in the chat and I'll be happy to address them uh, afterwards. Uh, but just in the interest of time, uh, I think I'll just uh, continue right through these. Uh, and it's a beautiful spring day in May and the Palouse is very green uh, as our Milwaukee train heads east. Uh, in the same area, just a little further uh, uh, south of town, we have this view of uh, a 200 train um, uh, proceeding east with very clean locomotives. Uh, these, in 1972, Milwaukee received uh, lots of these uh, new General Motors locomotives. Uh, and, if, and the photographer, David Clowender, turned around and we can see the locomotives just uh, starting out onto the concrete, concrete arch bridge. Looking at the train, you see there's some orange refrigerator cars of the potatoes and then carloads of British Columbia lumber and then carloads of warehouser lumber and then uh, the intermodal trailers from Seattle. Uh, that block back to the silver trailers is, will be set out at Minneapolis and then behind that are the cars going to Chicago. Uh, out on the uh, concrete arch bridge, uh, David Clowender got this picture of a 264 train. Uh, it's February, but uh, there are five cars of potatoes on the front there still being shipped. Uh, potatoes, of course, are uh, uh, last a long time and can be stored in Quonset huts, so they tended to be shipped all winter long. And if you look at the right, just ab above the right away, you can see the caboose of this train. Uh, and for whatever reason, it was stopped. Maybe there was uh, work on the track up ahead. And so he had time to do this photograph and then he uh, hiked back over to the hill on the other side of the highway and the Great Northern Track uh, to do this going away view of the same train. Uh, and then uh, at the other end of this long curving fill, uh, uh, Mr. Clowender got this picture in October 78 of uh, a, a 202 train uh, coming across the bridges and the big fill, uh, looking back on the valley heading towards Rosalia. Uh, and then uh, about six miles uh, east of uh, Rosalia uh, is Pandora Society. There's no industry there. It's just a 90 some car passing track where trains could pass. Uh, and this is very close to the end late October 1979 uh, and we have a dead freight west coming west with uh, uh, empty refrigerator cars, wood chip loads, grain loads, empty lumber cars and so on. Uh, this is my own view at, at Pandora from the other side of the tracks in the afternoon and you can see the big sweeping curve and the vista of the Palouse country uh, and this is August, so it's during the wheat harvest uh, and a long 201 train strung out. Um, uh, there's a couple of loads to set out at, at uh, Marengo to go to the Union Pacific and then behind that are wood chip cars from going to the Scott paper mill at Everett uh, and then uh, more wood chip loads behind that and then empty refrigerator cars to go to Othello and then grain loads and then autos and intermodal to go to Seattle. Uh, this is a reflexive view that uh, Mr. Clowender got uh, of an eastbound train coming across that trestle that was in the background of the previous view. Uh, and you see it uh, coming around the big curve. Uh, and uh, uh, you can see the intermodal to Chicago back behind the British Columbia lumber. There, the most of the slate potatoes are on the front. Uh, and then these are import Toyotas uh, that came through the port of Portland uh, towards the rear of the train. Uh, and then about uh, 
Uh, well, let me stop and mention about uh, Pandora is an infa infamous name in Milwaukee Road modern history. Uh, it was a scene of a terrible tragedy. Uh, the 40 miles of line between Malden and the Sorrento Tunnel, uh, just west of Plummer, there were no wayside signals indicating track occupancy. Uh, and this is an example of what railroaders call dark territory. Uh, and a safe operation in such a dark territory relies totally on the vigilance of the train crews to pre pre precisely follow messages or in railroad language train orders uh, that are delivered to them at the open stations like Malden, Plummer, St. Mary's, or Avery. Uh, and on the morning of February 19th, 1977, a westbound 205 TC train had orders to take the siding at Pandora and clear out to meet an eastbound 200 S train. Uh, but the head end crew on the westbound train overran the meeting point. Uh, and they paid for this mistake with their lives. And Mr. Clowender was on hand that same morning to go out and, and witness the horrible wreck. Uh, so uh, the 163 locomotive you see was the lead locomotive on the eastbound train. Uh, and it has crashed into the uh, lead locomotive of the westbound train. The tracks make a big curve here and a deep cut. So the trains could not see each other uh, and you know, suddenly there they are and there's no way to stop in time uh, and you have a, a tragic collision. Uh, and you can see how the 163 locomotive climbed up on the 200 uh, locomotive and collapsed the cab, uh, uh, killing the, the crew on the, on the westbound train. Uh, here's a close up of that uh, horror. Uh, and another view. Uh, if you look in the upper right, you can see a helicopter. I suspect that might be the Spokane television station uh, come down to see the, the horrible crash. Okay, so we'll go back to our, our journey eastward now. Um, uh, if we continue about another six or seven miles from uh, Pandora, uh, the next station name is Seabury, where there's a grain elevator on the Milwaukee. Uh, but that's also where there's a bridge uh, over uh, uh, the uh, what was at the in the 1970s a Bur Burlington Northern Branch and before that a Great Northern Branch and before that the Spokane and Inland Empire Interurban that uh, uh, went across. Um, uh, this was on on their their line to Moscow, uh, Idaho. Here we have a, a westbound 203 train uh, coming over that bridge. Uh, this is uh, with a normal lens where you can see the, the wheat fields. And then I switch to a telephoto lens and you can see the radio controlled locomotives in the middle of the train uh, approaching uh, the bridge. Uh, and uh, in, even in 1975, the traffic was still pretty healthy on the Milwaukee road. Uh, you see the mix of grain loads, uh, Reading box cars of merchandise from back east coming transcontinental. Uh, the loads of autos from Midwestern assembly plants uh, and so on. Mr. Clowender climbed up on the roadbed uh, a year later and did this picture where we're looking west on the Milwaukee tracks and you can see the Burlington Northern branch line tracks underneath. You remember Mr. Borleski told you that the Manning Bridge had been abandoned. They didn't, uh, uh, this line also didn't go all the way to Moscow anymore. After the Burlington Northern merger, they primarily used the Northern Pacific tracks for through movements. And this was just a grain gathering network for them. Uh, <laughs> continuing east, uh, about halfway between Seabury and Tico, we have this view. Uh, the line goes through some pretty deep cuts to maintain the very steady gradual 0.4% grade. Uh, and here we have an eastbound 200 train with the uh, Toyota autos on right behind the locomotives. Uh, and uh, uh, Tico is before you get to that hill in the distance. Uh, this is a little map so you can see where we go. We've gone from Malden through Squaw Canyon and the line looped around to Rosalia and across Seabury. And uh, now we're coming up to Tico uh, following the blue line. Uh, and that's where a Union Pacific Tico branch goes underneath. 
I was uh, fortunate in the summer of 1975 uh, to be the relief agent at Tico when the regular agent went on vacation. Uh, and so I could do a few photographs of the trains there and I got uh, very fortunate one day to get in, uh, some over and under views. Uh, but here, here we have uh, the town underneath the trestle in the background and a train on the Union Pacific tracks going north towards Spokane. Those little containers are full of export lentils from uh, Moscow, Idaho on their way to the port of Portland. Uh, and then up above you see the Milwaukee uh, went by the town on a high trestle maintaining the very steady grade. Um, there were some grain elevators at the west end of the Milwaukee Bridge um, uh, uh, but really was the Union Pacific was down in the town. And now let's move around to the south side of the bridge. Uh, and uh, you see the Union Pacific tracks below and a shuttle grain block uh, parked in the passing track there. Uh, and, uh, and we see overhead the Milwaukee uh, 200S train uh, going overhead. Uh, with three locomotives. Uh, and then behind that, these are the big uh, mechanical refrigerator cars uh, hauling the, uh, uh, the Columbia Basin potatoes. Uh, in August, it's a typical 100 degree day. And uh, you know those potatoes came right out of the fields into the cars uh, and they're very hot. So those refrigeration motors are working very hard to bring these potatoes down to temperature. Um, So in the next view here, if you look carefully, you can see exhaust pouring out of these reefers as those motors are struggling hard to cool all these uh, heavy loads of potatoes. Uh, each car probably has uh, between 80, uh, 80 plus tons of, of potatoes in there and is trying to cool. And while the train continues to rumble east, uh, then the Union Pacific uh, Tico branch train shows up uh, you see him at the lower right uh, while the Milwaukee train rumbles overhead uh, and he comes by. Um, uh, he will present, the Union Pacific train will stop just after he goes by me and pick up my instructions about uh, spotting all those grain cars at various elevators uh, out to, uh, on the spur to Tilma, Idaho. Uh, and then this wasn't the end of the action because at the west end of the bridge is the Tico passing track for the Milwaukee road and there was a westbound uh, 205 train waiting in that passing track for this 200 train to go by. So after the 200 clears, then the 205 train comes out on the bridge. And you see the, the locomotives uh, smoking as they accelerate to bring the train up to track speed as they leave the passing track. Uh, continuing east uh, from Tico, um, uh, about seven miles from Tico is uh, uh, Maori was another passing track. Um, and this was uh, one of the rare stretches where Milwaukee invested money. And from Plummer to uh, Maori, the track was completely rebuilt uh, in the late 70s with welded rail and new ballast. Uh, so here we see a westbound 207 train on the welded rail and the new ballast uh, drifting down grade. Uh, from the Sorrento Tunnel. Uh, and then here we are at the Sorrento Tunnel, the top of the gradual grade from Malden, 42 miles. Uh, and outside the other, the other end of the tunnel will be going down grade uh, towards St. Mary's. Uh, so let's jump over to the other side of the tunnel. Uh, and here we have a uh, 205 train uh, coming up the grade from uh, the Plummer Town. Uh, there was a new highway overpass built uh, about 1975 and you can see the dirt from the construction there. And so it made a nice vantage point. Uh, it used to be very treed in and you couldn't do a photograph here, but in the late seventies you could. Uh, so this is a, a little sequence where we have uh, the head end of the train and we turn around and you can see the train heading, uh, approaching the Sorrento tunnel uh, at the summit of the hill. And, uh, the phone line, the code line went over the top of the hill, as you can see there. This is a late October shot, so you can see some fall color in the trees. Uh, then we have uh, a 200 train uh, coming out of the tunnel in December, so we have uh, a nice uh, layer of frost on the ground. 
Uh, and again, we have uh, the Columbia Basin loads of potatoes right behind the locomotives uh, moving through the winter. Uh, and then turning around, we have a 203 train coming west uh, through the frosty landscape. Uh, and uh, uh, he has uh, the radio control locomotives in the middle of the train. Uh, and then right behind the caboose, if you look up in the shadows, you'll see a light of uh, a motor car where the track inspector is uh, following the train out of town uh, to, to go and uh, work, on, work on the tracks. Okay, so we're almost to Plummer. Uh, and so here we have a view at uh, uh, the Milwaukee uh, uh, trackage at Plummer. A lot of haze in the sky from the wigwam burners. Uh, perhaps you remember those before they were outlawed that uh, a lot of the wood waste at the lumber mills was uh, burned in wigwam burners like you see here. Um, uh, this is a train on eastbound train on the main line 264 and he's uh, uh, stopped here at Plummer to do some switching work. He's set out one locomotive behind the train there that's going to be used uh, to power a work train uh, and he has a load of automobiles and a Southern Pacific boxcar right behind the locomotives that are going to Spokane. And if you look on the lower level tracks behind the trains, you see lots of loads of automobiles. Those came on westbound trains from the Midwestern auto assembly plants. Uh, they're also going to Spokane. Uh, and uh, whereas the load on this train came up from the California assembly plant, different models were assembled in different plants uh, for the domestic automakers. Uh, and this will all be put together and then the crew that comes out of Spokane will come and pick this up and take it back. Uh, at the far right is the Union Pacific track going into the uh, lumber company owned by the uh, Indian tribe and plumber. Uh, and in the next view, uh, we can see how the train is uncoupled and he's pushing that auto rack and the Southern Pacific boxcar onto coupling it up to the other string of autos that are already there after uh, he couples them up, he'll uncouple and the locomotives will go back onto the train and he'll uh, continue towards St. Mary's and Avery. Uh, okay, so let me take you on a brief side trip. You remember uh, we heard that passenger trains had uh, foregone the route through Malden in favor of going through Spokane and Plummer was where they came back uh, to the main line. Uh, and on this map, if you look at in the upper right there, is that leaving Spokane, it's a red line owned by Union Pacific, uh, about 17 miles to Manitou. And then it becomes the blue line where the track is owned by Milwaukee Road to Plummer. Uh, and then a red line starts again uh, for the Union Pacific branch going to uh, Kellogg and Wallace. And then the blue line for the Milwaukee continuing to St. Mary's and Avery. So trains out of Spokane coming to Plummer uh, used Union Pacific owned tracks for a ways and then used Milwaukee road tracks for a ways. Uh, and so this is uh, an excerpt from the Union Pacific uh, employees timetable, which covered the section uh, from East Spokane to Manitou. And this is an excerpt from the Milwaukee road timetable, which governed the segment from Manitou to Plummer and the two railroads had different ideas about what's east and what's west on what was basically a north-south railroad. Uh, so they laid out their timetables upside down relative to each other. Uh, on this trackage in the 1970s, uh, the Milwaukee Road ran a train from Spokane down to Plummer and back six days a week to pick up what the mainline trains had set out and deliver cars from Spokane for the mainline trains to pick up. The Union Pacific had uh, a couple of trains, one going every day out to Kellogg uh, to get all the stuff from the Bunker Hill mine. This was very high revenue traffic for the Union Pacific, all the lead and zinc loads. Uh, and then plus the local, like we saw going under the Tico Bridge, going down uh, to the grain uh, country, uh, uh, down through Saltis and Colfax and Winona and La Crosse uh, and so on. Uh, I was fortunate in September of 1975 to uh, relieve the regular agent at Dishman, Washington. So I was the agent uh, for a couple weeks there. Uh, and at Dishman, the trains, 
both Union Pacific and Milwaukee road trains leaving Spokane would receive their orders. Uh, so if you look next to the depot at that tall old semaphore signal and you see the bar is out, that says the telling the train crew, you cannot pass Dishman unless you pick up the orders. And so you see the crewman leaning out to pick up the train orders. Uh, it had been a long time since I had worked uh, a job where we delivered train orders to trains. I had been in more modern territories for a couple of years. Uh, and so I didn't remember how high to position the hoops. And so you see he's leaning out pretty far to grab the orders. Uh, he gave me an earful as he passed by saying, uh, you know, blankety blank, get that hoop higher next time. Uh, this is an example of a Milwaukee Road order I copied at uh, Dishman, uh, where engine 5002 would power their train from Spokane to Plummer. Uh, and this gives them the authority to run extra from Manitou to Plummer. That's the portion that's the Milwaukee track and has right over number 387, which was the Union Pacific train from Manitou to Plummer. Uh, so they uh, know that they can proceed to Plummer without opposition. Uh, uh, coming up from Dishman, the tracks climb up Micah Canyon on a 1.5% grade. So uh, the Milwaukee passenger trains uh, had a steep grade to climb and in steep days, they had to double head the passenger trains up this grade. This is a relatively short Union Pacific train, so he, he's able to go up the grade no problem. Uh, this is a Milwaukee road train coming back from Plummer to Spokane, coming down the grade at uh, Micah's siding. Uh, and we have four locomotives and you see the mixed train. Uh, there are empty lumber cars for Coeur d'Alene Mills. Uh, there are loads of coal for the cement plant at Meadowline Falls. And there are loads of autos for Spokane. And then there are, uh, loads of grain near the back for the flour mills in Spokane. Uh, and then uh, proceeding further south, uh, we're now just past Manitou on the Milwaukee road tracks. So this is a Union Pacific train on the Milwaukee road track and he's bringing empty box cars back for lead and zinc loading. And all those tank cars are full of acids they used in the mining uh, uh, to leach out uh, uh, the minerals. Uh, and that yard limit sign means we're only about one mile from uh, the Manitou station site. Uh, years ago, underneath that trestle in the middle of the picture, there was another Union Pacific branch line which went down to Lake Coeur d'Alene and connected with uh, steamboats that ran across the lake. Uh, and then continuing further south, uh, we crossed the border into Idaho. Uh, this is near Setters and this is the Union Pacific train coming back uh, from Kellogg with all the lead and zinc loads. Uh, lots of high revenue uh, for Union Pacific, so they were very glad to have this line. Uh, and this is at Manitou itself. Uh, we're looking, uh, that Union Pacific train is coming off the Milwaukee Road track. And at the right is the Union Pacific track that's coming up from Tico, and the lines come together here to go down to Spokane. Okay, now we're down at Plummer and uh, coming at us is train 200, which has got a crew from Malden and is proceeding east on the main line. And right next to the train is the Plummer passing track. And then at the right, at the far right is the curving in is the track from Spokane. It came from Manitou. Uh, and you see how the depot at Plummer was situated on the Spokane line, not on the main line, because that was the way the passenger trains went. Uh, the track branching off at the lower right is the Union Pacific track to Kellogg and Wallace. And whereas uh, the track immediately to the left of it is the Milwaukee track about to merge with the main line. So here's our, our 200 train in uh, March. There's still some snow on the ground at Plummer. Uh, and if we turn around, uh, he's starting down the 1% grade down Plummer Canyon and right to the left of him is the Union Pacific track which goes down a much steeper at this point 2% and later on 1.8% grade down Plummer Canyon. Uh, you notice the great northern boxcars in the foreground. Um, some of the conditions of the Burlington Northern merger was that Milwaukee Road could haul traffic 
all the way to the Twin Cities and then turn it over to Burlington Northern there. Before the merger, they would have not been able to load Burlington Northern cars and haul them all the way east. Uh, they would have to give them that traffic in Seattle. So this was part of the conditions which increased the traffic on the line uh, very, very strongly in the early 1970s. Uh, in 1976, the old Plummer Depot was torn down. It was in danger of collapsing. Uh, and Milwaukee built this very small brick depot, now not located on the passenger line, but located over on the freight line. Uh, and so here we have a, a 202 train. He has uh, just finished setting out those autos in the background that came up from California. Uh, you notice the pickup trucks and the Mustangs and so forth. And now he's... Uh, ready to depart Plummer and head down the hill to St. Mary's. Uh, and now we're proceeding down uh, uh, Plummer Canyon. Uh, this is uh, a short train from Spokane. In the later years, instead of just turning around at Plummer, they sometimes went all the way to St. Mary's because now that was a yard and a crew change point. So it was uh, more convenient to interchange the Spokane traffic there instead of at Plummer. And if you look at in upper right from the locomotives, you'll see the Union Pacific track going down its much steeper grade. And this is uh, the reciprocal view. And uh, on the right, we have the Milwaukee road track and we see a train coming uphill on the Milwaukee road track and uh, the Union Pacific track, track on the left dropping down very steeply. Uh, now, from Plummer to St. Mary's is still an active railroad nowadays, uh, and so that track still exists, uh, and you can't uh, do your trail rides there. Uh, but the Union Pacific track on the left is gone, and that is now a trail, uh, so you can go down on the lower track there. Uh, I, if we, in that previous view, if we stand about right next to where the Milwaukee locomotives are on the hillside and look back up the hill, uh, we would see this. Here's a Union Pacific train dropping down the steep grade heading towards Wallace with the, the zinc and lead box cars and the acid tanks. And then the, uh, you look uphill from it on the left and you'll see uh, the grading for the Milwaukee right away. And if you look directly above the last visible tank car, you might be able to discern uh, right there, a red signal, there's a Milwaukee train coming, 200, train 200 is, is coming. Uh, I wasn't able to get two trains in the shot this time. Um, as the tracks come down towards uh, the Lake Coeur d'Alene area, they're still high up on the mountain. Uh, and uh, to maintain the steady 1% uh, descent, uh, that required a couple of large trestles. The largest is so-called PD viaduct. Uh, PD passing track starts right here at the signal and goes back up the hill here. And here we have a 200 train starting onto the high trestle. The highway to St. Mary's goes right underneath. So any of you who have driven over there uh, know where this spot is. Uh, and uh, back in the early 1970s, it wasn't as treated in as it is now. And so you could stand down by the highway and get a spectacular view of the trestle for a westbound train. This is a 263 train coming west with uh, the loads of gypsum from Heath, Montana and the automobiles uh, from the Midwestern assembly plants. This will be part of the Spokane set out. Then these are sugar cars for Moses Lake and then cars for further west. Uh, and then if you get up at PD by where the signal was, then you have a track level view like this. This is a 261 train uh, again, you have the Spokane set out here of uh, the autos and some intermodal. And then the next intermodal here is, is part of the block going to Seattle. Uh, and then finally, the tracks get down to lake level uh, and uh, they cross uh, Benoit Lake on this spectacular wood trestle. Um, and actually, if you look at this trestle carefully, it's kind of, it's level till about here. And then it's starting to go up. It's ramping up. The start of the 1.1% grade is actually right there in the middle of the trestle. Uh, and that was the engineering of the line to maintain that very steady minimum grade uh, engineering, very, very well engineered. And you see there's a little tunnel through a short little ridge here. On the other side of the tunnel, they pick up the St. Joe uh, River. This is a 261 train in, in 
August 1972 that I captured uh, climbing up the, the, the hillside. Uh, the more familiar view is uh, on the other side of the trestle from the, from the highway shoulder. Uh, like this view I got in August 1979, uh, you know, when the lake is very blue. Uh, and Mr. Clowender was there uh, a couple, uh, in October, and now we have a little fall color and, and different lighting. Uh, and you see the train coming out of the tunnel and across the bridge. The engines are probably uh, just revving up uh, right now as uh, they're getting onto the grade. You can see how the trestle ramps up. Uh, on the other side of the tunnel uh, is the railroad station name Ramsdale. Uh, we'll get there in a minute. This is uh, the view where I'm standing by that tunnel and we have a, a 200 train coming around the curve and onto the bridge off the grade and onto the level track. Uh, and you can see some fishermen in the lake and a nice uh, reflection uh, on a nice summer day. Uh, this is with a stronger telephoto and if we zoom back uh, then we get a little wider view of the area. And then on the other side of the tunnel is uh, uh, the Ramsdale log spur. So the, uh, the tunnel is just out of sight uh, to the left here, and this is the main line. And then there is a spur that went off here uh, to where the uh, logs that came down from uh, the branches up in the mountains south of St. Mary's were dumped into Lake Coeur d'Alene, into the St. Joe River, and then floated up to the big plywood and lumber mills at Coeur d'Alene. Uh, and uh, there was also a passing track at Ramsdale on the other side of the main line, but it was usually full of cars waiting to have the logs dumped in, into the water uh, to be floated up to the big mills on the north side of the lake. And then here's a photo at the, that Mr. Clowender got at the, uh, uh, at the east end of uh, Ramsdale. Um, it once upon a time was a passing track, but in modern times it was uh, uh, not it was shown as other tracks and it was always full of log cars waiting to be unloaded. Uh, then it's valley running uh, from Ramsdale to St. Mary's. Uh, this was, uh, Mr. Clowender captured this uh, westbound 201 train, uh, stopped uh, at some signals on a nice puffy cloud day. Uh, and a little further east uh, up on the hillside, we have this uh, springtime view of a, a westbound 207 train uh, uh, and a little bit of cattle in the field there. Uh, and there's still uh, snow up in the, the higher elevation uh, in late March. And then uh, around a couple more turns and we come into St. Mary's. Uh, and as I mentioned in night, at the end of 1974, uh, the crew terminal at Avery was moved to St. Mary's. And it, St. Mary's had not been a crew terminal before, and now they needed more facilities. And so you, you can see that they just, uh, in the economy move, they just <laughs> added part of a, a, a you know, a, a portable motorhome type structure to the depot uh, to create the additional office space for the crew collar and the boardroom uh, and the register room and so on. You see all the log cars in the yard and box cars for the, uh, the lumber and plywood mills in, in town uh, and the snow plow for the branch line. Uh, for this depot still stands. It's still used uh, by uh, the short line that took over this portion of the Milwaukee. And fortunately, they got rid of this atrocity that was added onto the depot and it's a much prettier structure again. Uh, continuing uh, east, um, uh, we, we'll skip Omega siding on, on, the, on, a, on the wrong side of the river from the highway and then a dead end road. Uh, and then when we come back to the highway is at this spot uh, and we have a westbound 263 train around, along the St. Joe River. You can see the loads of gypsum and the empty sugar cars going back to the Moses Lake uh, sugar refinery uh, and then intermodal for Seattle further back in the train. Uh, and if we go continuing uh, east a little further, uh, uh, just uh, maybe a half mile further, we have this view of a 261 train along the river. And you can see the river's uh, quite calm, not running fast. It's a very gentle grade. Uh, the train's uh, coming downhill on a very, very moderate grade. Uh, and then further on, uh, getting close to Calder, we have a, 
another view of the, the 261 train and you see the strong intermodal and automotive traffic uh, that Milwaukee had. The automotive traffic was very high revenue, uh, very, very profitable uh, traffic. Uh, and then continuing uh, east from Calder, and now uh, we have a view from Mr. Clowinder in the fall, and the river is much lower uh, and in this time of year. Uh, and then looking going away, we have fall color uh, along the river and uh, uh, the lumber loads nicely reflected uh, in the shadowy St. Joe. Uh, and then around a couple more bends, we will arrive at Avery uh, at the foot of the Bitterroots grade. Uh, and uh, here we have a picture of a, a train with our crew from Malden uh, pulling up to the depot at Avery. And you see the crew that will relieve them is waiting on the steps. And behind that is the substation. Uh, and overhead is the catenary that it's the substation is converting the 110,000 volt uh, commercial AC power to 3,400 volt direct current power for the, for the electric trains. And we have uh, three diesels on the front. Uh, and, uh, and then behind that, uh, we start to have all the ice refrigerator cars of the Columbia Basin potatoes. First, the engines will stop at the depot. So the front, the head end crew can change. And then when the Montana crew, the Rocky Mountain crew is on and they're ready to go, they'll pull forward. Uh, uh, and uh, this train, 1972, I had 58 ice refrigerator cars of Columbia Basin potatoes. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is only 18 hours in this hot summer weather to make it from Othello to Deer Lodge uh, to be re-iced. So they had to hustle uh, to get these potatoes to market in good shape. And in the middle of the, whoops, I guess uh, that's all I have for that one. This is a view uh, uh, have a train approaching from Malden to a coming into the yards at Avery. And while like in that previous picture, the time freights just simply change crews at the depot, uh, the dead freights uh, of lumber and the like uh, would uh, double on the short yard tracks would have to double their train over uh, and park the train there so that it could be switched out. You have the schoolhouse for Avery over on this side of the canyon. And on this side of the canyon in the back, you see the engine house and the old uh, oil tank for the uh, steam locomotives uh, back in the day. Uh, so an old uh, stand for a semaphore signal. I'm standing on the highway bridge, which crossed from one side of the canyon to the other there. You notice uh, where the, the, the engine house is back here, the, the road and the town is over here, not over here. So this, you're wondering, okay, there's no road along here. How do you get to this place? Uh, well, now our diesels from Malden are parked back at the engine house. You see some electrics also parked here, and we've added a couple of uh, the little Joe electrics to continue switching the train. Uh, these wood chips are going to the paper mill in Missoula, so they need to be pulled up towards the front of the train, uh, and the auto racks need to be towards the back because uh, they're very lightweight and could get collapsed in the braking forces. And then these lumber loads we probably want in the middle or towards the front, so the Rocky Mountain crew will be switching the train into the, the best order for their division. This is how you get to the engine house. You had to cross this rickety suspension bridge over the St. Joe River. Uh, the sign claims that it had a one ton capacity. Uh, I certainly didn't wasn't in the mood to test whether it had that weight limit or not. I was uh, uh, usually pretty uh, white knuckled gripping the steering wheel very hard to drive across <laughs> this bridge to get to the engine house. Uh, but if you had the bravery to do it, uh, before uh, June 1974, there were some real treasures to see. Uh, the box motor electrics built before World War I uh, were still hauling heavy trains over the Bitterroot Mountains. Very old locomotives, but very powerful locomotives. It was remarkable the tonnage uh, they could handle. Uh, and you can see <laughs> there's a marker light here, but there isn't one over here anymore. Uh, but these old uh, beasts kept uh, uh, running uh, right to the end. Very impressive. Uh, you also had the more modern uh, so-called Little Joe, uh, beautiful, sleek locomotives, very powerful, very fast, uh, you know, 
uh, whereas the diesels were 3,000 horsepower uh, at at the at the output of the diesel. By the time you go through generators and electric traction, there was only about 26 or 2,700 horsepower. Whereas these little electrics were 5,500 horsepower at the rail. So they were, one of these was worth about two diesel units. Uh, at times, Avery could be empty of trains and at other times it could be very, very busy, uh, such as here. Uh, so we have one westbound train here that has changed head end crew and the Malden crew is, is on. And now they're pulled up and the caboose is stopped at the depot so the rear end crew can change and the Rocky Mountain Division crew is getting off and the Malden crew is getting on. And meanwhile, the next time freight is pulled up right behind him with the Little Joe Electric leading the diesels. And then doubled over in the yard is the westbound uh, bed freight, the 265 train, uh, where they rested crews. This is the bunkhouse for the crews. This is the bunkhouse for the track workers, uh, the depot and the substation. Uh, they will, you know, make sure they have rested crews for the time freights. Uh, so those autos and uh, intermodal can be delivered on time. Uh, and the dead freight over here, when they have another rested crew, it'll run. So it might be parked here for 10 or 12 hours waiting for a rested crew uh, before it'll go on to Malden. Once that caboose clears, uh, then they will uncouple the electric Little Joe locomotive and take it to the engine house uh, and the train will have to proceed with just the diesel power uh, to Malden and Othello. But uh, as we know, it's a well-engineered line. They don't face anything worse than a 1% grade. So that's, that's enough power to do it. Um, uh, this, this, this photo means a lot to me. I, I, I always thought this branch was a wonderful place to just sit and watch the electric trains. You had the fish pond, and the Avery Depot had a restaurant in it. You see the lunchroom sign and you can see the electric locomotives. And if you go to Avery now, the depot is still there. They have rebuilt the fish pond and it's uh, uh, brand new and it's stocked with these immense uh, lake trout type fish. And there's a bench there, but there's no railroad anymore. <laughs> it's just a highway going by here now. Uh, inside the lunchroom, if we were a Malden crew, uh, we could wake up in the morning and get a real hearty breakfast in here. Uh, bacon and eggs and hash browns and orange juice and coffee. Uh, this is uh, just after the breakfast runch is over. Um, but this was kind of the social center of the town. Uh, and all the railroaders uh, from all the different railroad departments ate here. The Rocky Mountain Division crews, the Coast Division crews, the track maintenance forces, the station forces, uh, any visiting officials, um, and then everybody from the town ate there too. Uh, and uh, uh, after breakfast is over, this is a quiet period. This is uh, the roadmaster in charge of maintenance of the track. And you see him getting into his bill fill to pay his bill for his breakfast. This is one of the Rocky Mountain Division engineers who moved out from Iowa. He's uh, in, relaxing and enjoying his coffee. He's gonna get called for a time freight about 11 in the morning. So he's got some time to relax. And then this is the cook and the waitress and they have finally have a chance to sit down and relax after the breakfast rush. But at any rate, if we were a Malden uh, crewman after breakfast, we maybe we've been called for a westbound dead freight. We'll go out, we'll go over to the trainman's register room and we have standard clocks for the on Rocky Mountain time and coast time, and we can set our watch to make sure it's accurate and obey the train orders correctly and be reminded how important safety is. And we can sign the register book to say we're on duty for what train and who is the crew. Uh, and then we'll go out and uh, switch the yard. Uh, and uh, maybe we'll borrow the par pack set of the Motorola radio compared to the light little things we have now. In those days, a radio was a pretty heavy bulky, awkward piece of gear in 1972. Uh, this is a conductor directing the switching moves. And then when we were ready to go, we could go in and tell the uh, operator in the depot that, okay, we're ready for our orders. So we're ready to go to Malden. We got our train together. Uh, and Debbie Shosey was uh, the weekend operator in Avery. Uh, and she would get on the dispatcher's phone and you see the blue 
Milwaukee train order message forms with the carbons in there where they'll make, she'll make four copies, one for the depot and three copies for the crew. And she has to carefully repeat into the phone the message she's been dictated to to make sure she got it exactly right. Uh, and then she, uh, once we have our blue orders here and our clearance, we can step out to our dead freight west where you have the power here. Meanwhile, there's a dead freight east that's gonna proceed into Montana with electric power. Uh, and we're ready to go back to Malden and we've finished our tour up to Avery and you can imagine going back to Malden. Uh, and uh, I'll close with a, a kind of an epilogue of, of the end of the, mil the milestones in the end of the Milwaukee out west. Uh, December 1977, the Milwaukee Road declared bankruptcy for the third and final time in the history of the company. And in July 1978, the trustee announced his intention to abandon uh, all the lines west. Uh, in February 1980, the bankruptcy court approved the trustee's request to embargo lines west effective March 1, 1980. So starting March 1, the railroad refused all business on lines west. Uh, and then the very last train out of Tacoma left on March 15, hauling only uh, railroad equipment and empty railroad owned freight cars. Uh, so then the trustee had the task of selling off, liquidating the property. Uh, the segment from Malden to Plummer we went over was abandoned. Uh, Union Pacific in order to continue to serve that, get that lucrative lead and zinc business bought the Manitou to Plummer segment. Uh, and then uh, Potlatch had bought St. Mary's Plywood uh, and had uh, got rights to a lot of the timber up uh, Bo Beauville Elk River area, uh, and uh, as well as to purchase from the Forest Service at Avery. So they bought the railroad from Plummer to Avery in order to serve the St. Mary's Mill and they invested a lot of money to expand it and they formed a short line railroad called the St. Mary's River Railroad. Uh, but then in 1983, the Forest Service ended timber sales in the St. Joe National Forest. So then the line from St. Mary's to Avery became superfluous, so that was abandoned. So with these abandonments, we're left with out of that 109 miles from Malden to Avery, uh, we're only left with the 19 miles from Plummer to St. Mary's that still has a railroad. The mill in St. Mary's is still very active, uh, very profitable for potlatch, uh, they load uh, uh, lumber and plywood out of there and, and then to con connect with the other railroads, the 37 miles from Plummer to Spokane is, is still intact as well. So our last Milwaukee road train is headed off into the sunset uh, and it's only memories for old guys like me and younger folks can only wonder and, and be astonished that all this existed and then incredibly disappeared. Uh, and I'll thank you for your attention uh, and I'll stop this presentation and take a look at the questions in chat. And let me try to go back to the <laughs> last question. There's a lot of them. Uh, What was carried in the hoppers? Okay, so the, the open top hoppers uh, coming west had coal. Uh, the cement plant at Medeline Falls needed uh, a fair bit of coal. Uh, there were some other, um, a, a lot of things were still uh, steam heated and used uh, coal fired boilers. Uh, for example, those of you who went to Washington State uh, down at Pullman, hey, that campus needed coal. Uh, and so there were, you know, there were various customers like that. I imagine the, uh, uh, the sugar plant at Moses Lake also took uh, inbound coal. So what caused, sorry. Rob, Rob, this is Paul. Uh, that question might actually uh, re uh, refer specifically to the hoppers at Malden, which I believe were for the ballast pit there. Ah, so yes, yeah, so the the string of uh, uh, cars at Malden were being loaded with gravel to be used as ballast for ballasting the tracks and uh, the right of way. Uh, so that that was in, internal use. That was not revenue freight. 
they, 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 the covered hoppers, of course, were carrying grain. Uh, and um, in the 1960s, uh, the grain in Montana uh, primarily moved east uh, to the great to Duluth Superior uh, and to European markets. Uh, but starting with uh, the big Russian grain sales and others, uh, the grain from Montana and Dakota started coming west. So there was a, a big increase in grain coming west, a big increase in traffic for Milwaukee, as well as the other railroads to the northwest. And so you saw that in a lot of the pictures, the yellow and, and gray uh, covered hopper cars. What caused the contraction in business in the mid-1970s? Um, uh, th this is a complex story and I'll, I'll, I'll oversimplify somewhat to, to save time. Um, but while Milwaukee Road was a transcontinental railroad from the Pacific Northwest to Chicago, uh, it also had a dense network in the Midwest, lines all over Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, Illinois. Um, and uh, transportation rates are basically mileage rates. You get paid so much per mile. Uh, and railroad costs are, have a lot of fixed costs. You know, when you originate traffic, you have to handle each car one by one or each intermodal unit run by one. And so origin and destination has big costs. Just running a big train mile after mile is very cheap. So. The railroad economics is a long haul is very profitable and a short haul is very unprofitable. And the railroads were regulated companies. They had to accept any traffic that was tendered to them. And so Milwaukee had a huge amount of unprofitable short haul traffic in the Midwest, as did the other Midwestern railroads. The shortest hauls of all were in the Northeast. So those railroads went bankrupt first. Then the railroads with heavy networks in the Midwest went bankrupt like the Rock Island and the Milwaukee. Uh, and uh, so the, the railroad had been doing deferred maintenance for years and years and years to stave off bankruptcy. And the, uh, even though the traffic grew as a result of the Burlington Northern merger, it was not nearly enough to offset uh, the economics to the Midwest. So the whole company went bankrupt uh, and uh, uh, the, for whatever reason, the trustee decided that they just couldn't afford to invest uh, to bring back the track on the long transcontinental railroad. That was just too huge a cost. So they decided to contract to a Midwestern railroad. Uh, and I won't go into whether that was a good idea or not. We could spend a lot of time on that. Um, uh, don't see questions. They're just sort of comments in the next one. So let me skip, skip, the, uh, skip those. Uh, what railroad ran under the concrete arch branch? Well, that was another Burlington Northern line. That, there were actually two that ran under those arch bridges. One was uh, another leg of the uh, uh, Spokane and Inland Empire um, line. That line that went across the Manning Covered Bridge on the way to Colfax went under the extreme west end of that arch bridge. And then under the arch bridge, uh, more out in the valley, was the Northern Pacific line uh, down to uh, uh, Pullman and Moscow and continuing down to Lewiston, Idaho. And that became the more primary route for Burlington Northern after the merger and the Great Northern route was just downgraded to if there was any grain business to gather that. Uh, and that, so that line still exists, the former Northern Pacific line and the Great Northern line is long gone. Why did some locos have dynamic braking and some did not on this gap? Uh, well, Milwaukee was always struggling uh, to conserve cash uh, and they made decisions to buy a mixture of locomotives with dynamic brakes and without. Uh, and uh, normally, ideally, the locomotives coming out west to Washington State would have dynamic brakes, uh, but because of utilization issues and locomotives not available, they sometimes set, sent locomotives out that were not equipped with dynamic brakes. It wasn't really that bad a problem because in the, uh, across in the electric districts uh, with an electric locomotive on the front, which could do regenerative braking and use the weight of the train to put power back in the line, they had tremendous 
braking power. So if the diesels didn't have much, it didn't matter. Uh, it did matter uh, from Othello to the West when, when uh, the second generation diesels were not compatible with the old box motor electrics. Uh, but they would typically have to add locomotives in Othello anyway for the steep grades, and they could add locomotives with dynamic brakes. Uh, did you get a photo of the most notable landmark at Pandora, the phone shed? Uh, there is, uh, in the Cascade Rail Foundation uh, collection, uh, a photograph of that, fan, of that shed. I, I chose not to include it in the, uh, in the presentation here. I, I mainly restricted it to photos that had trains in them. Um, is the Tico trestle yeah, extant? Yes, somebody answered that. Yes, it's there. There's uh, the trail will uh, <laughs> go across it, so you can pretend you're the Milwaukee train. When were the last ice reefer cars used? Uh, that's uh, a complicated question. What's an easy question to answer is when was the last icing service? Uh, and icing service ended in. September 1973. And after that, uh, the railroad would no longer provide ice. Um, and you had, you know, if you wanted refrigeration, you had to use one of the mechanically refrigerated cars. Um, but the ice reefer cars could be used if you didn't need refrigeration. And uh, a lot of shippers over the winter, when it was cold the whole way, would say, I don't need ice. The potatoes will stay cold enough. So those cars continue to be used in the non-summer season for a number of years. And I'm not sure when the last shipper decided, I don't want to use those cars anymore. The little cars were valuable because uh, some shippers wanted to sell smaller lots of potatoes and those cars held about half or 60% what the large mechanical reefers would held. So uh, they lasted around some time. And in fact, uh, there was one entrepreneur who bought up all the ice reefers as railroads were getting rid of them because he knew shippers still wanted to use them and he could lease these back to the railroads and he made a very good profit doing that. Um, uh, and there's a lot of informative comments there. Uh, thank you for all of those. You're, everyone's willing to look at it, but uh, uh, and I, I, I won't try to elaborate on all of those. Many of you probably know more about it than I do. I, I, next question is silver tip landing where they dump the logs. I'm not familiar where silver tip landing is. There, there's one landing where the trucks dump the logs into the river right in St. Mary's. Um, but the railroad had one at Ramsdale way out there by you know the other side of the tunnel from Benoit Lake. And that was the principal one back in the day. And, and back in the Milwaukee era, uh, the logs coming down from Beauville and Elk River up there, uh, were most of them were not going to the mill in St. Mary's, maybe none of them. They were going to the mills up around Coeur d'Alene. So there was a huge amount of log volume that came down those branches, was shuttled over to Ramsdale and dumped in the lake, chained together, and the little tugboats would take the logs up the lake uh, to the big mills. That was the principal source for those mills. Uh, later on, uh, Potlatch uh, acquired the mill in St. Mary's and acquired rights to a lot of the timber. And that's when things really changed to the modern area where the logs that came down that branch were actually going to St. Mary's rather than into the lake. When was the catenary removed at Avery? Well, again, this is a, a little awkward to answer because it's easy to answer when did the electric operation end, uh, and that was in the middle of June 1974 uh, on, uh, from Avery uh, eastward. Um, electric uh, operation had ended in, uh, in October 1972 from Othello westward. Um, and there were contracts let out for contractors to remove the wire and uh, where they were working, it was de-energized and wherever they weren't, uh, they kept it energized to discourage thieves. And I really don't know the order of contractors when they worked various segments. So I don't know exactly 
when the catenary was removed at Avery. But I can tell you, it was the last time it was used was June 1974. Uh, when was the Madeline Falls branch abandoned between McGuire's and Newport? Um, so uh, McGuire's was uh, a station name uh, about halfway from Spokane to Coeur d'Alene. And that's where the Milwaukee branch took off to go north through Newport and Usk up to ending at the cement plant at Madeline Falls. And there was basically no online business between McGuire's and Newport in the 1970s. All the business was up at Newport, Usk, and Meadowline Falls. Uh, and um, when uh, the state of Idaho was building Interstate 90, uh, they looked at that and said, you know, uh, we really don't want to spend the money to build an overpass over the Milwaukee Road. Uh, so why don't we twist the arm of Burlington Northern to give Milwaukee Road trackage rights uh, between uh, Spokane and Newport, and then they can get on their own track there. They don't have any customers on the way to Newport anyway, so why should they have to spend the money to maintain a track they don't really need? And so with that pressure from Idaho, the Burlington Northern agreed, uh, and so it was set up for Milwaukee to use the Burlington Northern. I was working at uh, Dishman at the time of the changeover in September 1975. So uh, the first part of my stay there, I would still see the Metaline Falls train go by the Dishman Depot on the way out to McGuire's. Uh, but then after my first weekend, that was it. And after that, they ran via the Great Northern up through Hilliard. So I can tell you that uh, September 75 is when they stopped running that way. Uh, was there interchange at Rosalia? Um, in the 1970s, uh, no, there was not. I don't know if there was a ramp track down from the Milwaukee to the other railroads in, in much earlier years. Uh, you know, ask the his, his, historic, historic experts. Uh, I'm not the right guy to ask for that. Uh, was the house at the PD Viaduct for a bridge uh, maintain track maintenance personnel. Um, I'm really not sure. I can tell you that by the time I got there, it was it was abandoned. It wasn't occupied. It's quite possible it was used by railroad employees in earlier years. I I just don't know. Uh, was the Hanford branch still used to serve the site after 1950? Uh, and the answer is yes, uh, but the traffic was very intermittent. Uh, I think they were basically hauling dismantled stuff out. Uh, there wasn't regular traffic into there like there was during World War II. Uh, and it was still in the timetable into the 1970s. Uh, so they could haul stuff in there uh, when or haul stuff out if they needed to. But it was rare to see a train movement uh, on the Hanford branch uh, in the 1970s. Where did that McGuire turn take off from the line from Dishman to Coeur d'Alene? Well, um, uh, <laughs> is, uh, I can look it up here in the timetable to tell you the mileage from, uh, from uh, Dishman to McGuire's. Let's see here. Uh, okay, uh, McGuire's is 15 miles uh, from Dishman, 15.0 even. Uh, just past a, a station in Milwaukee called Sco Spokane Bridge, and uh, uh, and then at, at uh, McGuire's is where the 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 metal line line turned off. Actually, the way the timetable was set up, they made the Dishman to McGuire's section part of the subdivision that went up to Meadowline Falls. Sorry for the noise in the background. That's my dog playing with his toy. Uh, is there truth to the rumor that boxcars full of Model Ts ended up in Rock Lake near Rosalia? Well, again, this is a very historical question. There definitely are <laughs> boxcars down there. I have no idea if what, if anything, was in them. Any more questions?
you know, I'm glad to share this with you, uh, folks. There's not too many people who remember this stuff now. <laughs>